Well, folks, welcome. I'm Pastor Dave from Valley View Baptist Church in North Ogden, Utah, and it's my privilege to invite you to uh, a time of worship and message uh, from our Lord. And as always, we're speaking about our exceeding abundantly able God from Ephesians 2, uh, 3, verses 20 and uh, 21. And yes, we must remember too, particularly during these difficult times, that faith defeats fear, faith defeats stress, faith defeats anxiety, faith defeats discouragement. And certainly Satan is having a field day these days with these with fear, stress, anxiety, and just dis, dis, discouragement. But folks, God's still on his throne. He's still in the miracle business. He's still all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere present at the same time. So with those thoughts in, in mind, let's think about Jesus. Think about our triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we uh, are so honored to come into the presence of these folks that are listening and watching, I thank you for the opportunity to talk about you, to talk about your plan. You know, it's, it's your person, your power, and your promises, Lord, that keeps us, keeps us going, keeps us safe, Lord. And so I do pray for our time together today. And yes, Lord, I, I pray for those that are providing such awesome service uh, to keep us alive. The medical people, the doctors and the nurses in the trenches, risking their own life to save lives. That's an awesome, awesome responsibility, but they're just wearing themselves thin. I pray, Father, that somehow you provide additional resources for them. Thank you for our military, our National Guard. I thank you for our police officers and those that are just always there for us uh, to protect us. So thank you for them. But Lord, my love and my gratitude and my thanks to you. You're so such a personal Lord. You're, you're you're just there for us so many times. And I thank you and I praise you. And yes, I pray for the resolve, Lord, of this pandemic that we can uh, see the end of it and get back to uh, our worship and our churches and have our choir and, and activities and things that, uh, that you want us to do. So we ask your, your blessing. Now, Lord, as we get into your word, I just pray your spirit would guide me, Lord, and it's just your words that should go from my heart to my mouth to the people that are listening. So you have your way, Lord, and we'll thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as always, folks, too, I try to add a few things at the beginning and end of my uh, messages so we can just kind of think about the Lord. This is called The Way of Calvary. I don't know who, who wrote it. I got it out of a sort of the Lord newspaper some years ago. The Way of Calvary. Men told me there were many ways that lead at last to God. And so through long and trying days, each one of them I trod. But I did not find my father's throne nor feel myself set free until I walk one day alone the way of Calvary. It is a rugged road and brings us many a loss, one in which we bear a load, the pressure of a cross. Yet it is open all the way, through it the heart can see, the open gates of day, the way of Calvary. And then this one kind of uh, parallels that a little bit. It's called Thou Rememberest, and it's by J.D.W. Uh, Kirshner. It says, When winter rains and flowers are dead, 
and songbirds with their songs have fled. When trees are etched on uh, leaden skies and poverty is anguish cry and funeral trains go o'er the snow, O oh God, how good it is to know that thou remainest. When man his courage would reveal, when he would build his towers of steel and granite blocks to pierce the sky and would the hand of time defy. While here it is strength, yet he doth know that these as well someday must go. For ruins fill the ancient world and to the depths man's pride is hurled, but thou remainest. Why should I grieve and be afraid when in the grave my hopes are laid? Well, do I know that death must be unless my Lord shall come for me. Therefore build I my life on thee, foundation of eternity, for thou remainest, yes, our Lord remainest, as no beginning and no end. It's just absolutely awesome. And then this one I'll share with you and then we'll get into the message. God's unspeakable gift. God loved the world, God gave his son. What more than this could love have done to save lost men? See here the height, the only son from highest heaven, the mighty one, the prince of peace. See here the depth to sinful earth. The Lord came down and here had birth and lived and died. Behold the length, Life evermore for dying souls of boundless store, unending bliss. Behold the breath, whatever, whoever will, of, of mercy's draught may take his fill and without price. O oh, precious gift, O oh, wondrous love, join all below and all above to sing his praise. That's from the voice in the wilderness so I thought those three little sayings would be helpful as we just think about Jesus. And this is the second message in series on, on the uh, end times. And so let's, let's just uh, put it to a uh, test here, okay? Will the church of Jesus Christ go through the coming great tribulation or will she be raptured before that awful day of the Lord comes upon the earth. This is one of the burning questions of the day. And many believers are at a loss what to believe with able and sincere champions on both sides of the fence. It's been held by theologians throughout the entire history of the church that the rapture would take place before the tribulation came upon the earth. Recently, however, there has been a revival of the error that the church will have to pass through part or all of this awful coming day. So it's, the doctrine is not by any means new or modern, but was already present in the early church in apostolic times. Satan knows full well the power of the blessed hope. We talked about that last week and we'll talk about it again here as we, as we go. Uh, he knows it is of greatest comfort in days of darkness, of sanctifying power in a world of sin, a blessed hope in a world plunging on to a certain judgment. He would therefore do anything to take from us the comfort, the power, and the hope of Jesus' imminent return for his church before the tribulation. Paul, Paul had something to say in Thessalonians, and I'd like to share a few thoughts there. False teaching concerning the return of Christ was already rife in the days of the Apostle Paul. The first two epistles of Paul, first and second Thessalonians, were written to correct two serious errors with regard to this very subject, the return of, the Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians, 
was inspired and written to correct a misunderstanding concerning the premillennial rapture, while 2 Thessalonians was written to correct an error concerning the pre-tribulation rapture. So let me just repeat that. 1 Thessalonians teaches the truth of the premillennial rapture, while 2 Thessalonians establishes the truth of the pre-tribulation rapture. So 1 Thessalonians was Paul's first inspired letter ever to come from his pen. On his second missionary journey, Paul had spent about two weeks in Thessalonica preaching the gospel of the dead, the resurrection and the second coming of Christ. It seems that he had told them that Jesus was coming again soon. And when he did come, they, the believers, would all enter with him into the kingdom of our Lord here upon the earth. In this hope, they were very, very happy. When trials and tribulations came, when they suffered for their faith and testimony, they comforted themselves with the blessed assurance of Paul's preaching that the Lord might come soon, and then they all would enter with him into the glorious kingdom. He's talking about the rapture of the church. But when an, <clears throat> a great disappoint, disappointment overtook them, let me say that again, but then a great disappointment overtook them. Some of the believers in Thessalonica fell sick and died. As they laid them away, they began to doubt and asked, did not Paul tell us Jesus was coming and we all would share in the kingdom with him? But now what about these departed loved ones? If Jesus comes, we who are alive will enter in, but these dead will miss out in the reign of Christ. Well, it greatly disturbed them. For as yet they knew not the truth of the first resurrection before the kingdom was to be set up. Paul had evidently not found time to fully instruct them uh, uh, during this brief stay of only two weeks in Thessalonica. They knew nothing about the first resurrection of believers at Jesus' coming. They were still post-millennial, believing in a general resurrection at the end of time. Well, Paul, when Paul heard, hears about their confusion and sorrow, he immediately sets to, to himself to write a letter to them in which he sets their hearts at rest by a wonderful, comforting, new truth. This letter, which Paul wrote, is known as the first epistle of Paul to Thessalonica. The heart of this epistle is chapter 4, verses 13 through 19, in which he answers the question of these believers in this simple and inspired revelation so well known uh, to us. And I, I'm going to read 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the, to meet the, in the clouds. Let me say that again. Then we which are alive and remain 
shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then this awesome verse, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Paul was clarifying any false teaching of the day with this passage of, of scripture. Really folks, an explanation of this passage hardly seems necessary. It's so simple, so direct, so clear that even a child should be able to easily understand it. Paul says in essence, stop worrying about your loved ones who have died as though they will miss out on something when Jesus comes. He says, I would not have you to be ignorant, uh, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Then after telling them this revelation is from God and not from man, in verse six, 16, he tells them that when Jesus comes and shouts from the air and the trumpet sounds, all the bodies of the dead believers in all ages will suddenly come up out of their graves, first in new glorified resurrection bodies, immediately after, in the twinkling of an eye. These who are then alive when Jesus comes will be instantly changed, receive immortal bodies, and join with the resurrected one, rise to meet the Lord in the air. You see, the Lord doesn't come to earth at this time. He comes in the air. You folks read that fourth chapter of, of 1 uh, Thessalonians and uh, it'll be a blessing to you. The, when he calls, he comes in the air with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. He's still in the air, he's in the clouds. Scripture says, meet him in the clouds, okay? And so that's the rapture of the church and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain. You see, the, the rapture is imminent. Nothing else has to be done. That's what imminent means. Nothing else has to be done before this. In other words, no prophecy has to be fulfilled before the rapture of the church. It's imminent. It can happen any, any, any time. So, uh, so, Comfort yourselves concerning your departed loved ones. So instead of being left behind, these dead in Christ shall rise first. We shall not precede them at all, but they will be the first ones to hear the shout. To those of you who are listening in, who are mourning today over loved ones who have gone on before, may I suggest that you just read and reread 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And you'll experience the same peace and comfort which the Thessalonians experienced to whom Paul said, wherefore comfort one another with these words. You know, folks, that's going to be a great reunion. And, and I've shared with a few of my Chris, Christian friends and even shared it in, in a, a message, I, you know, I'm kind of in a reunion mode. You know, I'm ready for that reunion. And say, so even so, come Lord Jesus. But between now and then, please let's be witnesses for Christ and share this wonderful uh, text and wonderful promise of our Lord. Well, then there's the next test. Satan does not leave God's people alone for very long. Soon after Paul had put these believers at rest concerning the premillennial rapture, another error crept in the Thessalonian church. Someone, we don't know, I have no idea who it was, wrote a letter to the church in Thessalonica claiming it was inspired by the Spirit and signed Paul's name to this, to this uh, spurless epistle. It was, of course, a forgery but these believers were unaware of this fact. In this letter, this false teacher, this imposter and forger told these Thessalonian Christians 
that they were even then in the tribulation period, the lawful suffering and vicious persecutions they were enduring for Christ's sake, this letter said, was part of the tribulation period. Naturally, they were disturbed for they had understood Paul uh, to say that when he was with them, that they would escape the tribulation period, that the dead in Christ would be raised first, and then all of us be raptured before the day of the Lord would come. And now here comes a letter with Paul's name attached, saying they were now in the tribulation. You, we can easily imagine, can't we? Can't we, folks, the consternation they must have felt. If this was the tribulation and the church was to be caught away before the tribulation, it meant that they had been left behind. No wonder they were upset. Suppose you awaken tomorrow morning to find Christ had come during the night to take the church to heaven and you were left behind and you were still here. How would you feel? Well, that's how they felt in Thessalonica. And when Paul hears of this, he immediately writes the second, his second epistle to them. In chapter two, he takes up this problem and says, now I beseech you brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of the Christ is his hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. Second Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 3. So listen, folks, to what Paul says. Don't be upset by this false epistle as though it were from me. I never even wrote it. Whoever told you this was a tribulation it, that this was the tribulation, was a deceiver and an imposter. I want you to note carefully the last phrase of the verse two, which Paul says, as they, as that the day of the Lord is at hand. Two corrections, folks, should be, should be made in this phrase. And this, I, I quote M. R. D. Hahn on this. The expression day of Christ should be translated day of the Lord. The word in the original Greek is kurios, K-U-R-I-O-S, meaning Lord, and not Christos, C-H-R-I-S-T-O-S, meaning Christ. You can look in your Bible dictionary or in your concordance and, and, and see this. Then the last two words at hand should read now present. So that Paul really is saying, don't believe this deceiver who tells you that the day of the Lord and the tribulation is already here. So back again to 1 Thessalonians, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Well, then follows the answer and Paul says the tribulation that day will not come until two things happen. First, he gives them in verse, verse three of Second Thessalonians two. That day, meaning the day of the Lord, shall not come except there be a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Well, two things must occur before the tribulation can set in. One, a great apostasy, and two, the revelation of the, of the Antichrist. However, this man of sin, the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the church first is taken out. In our coming messages, we'll study Paul's teaching on this subject, but before we kind of finish up the message today, may I share again that the day of the Lord cannot come till the man of sin is first revealed and the man of sin cannot be revealed until the church is gone. Folks, I'm looking for Jesus to come in the air. I don't care who the Antichrist is, but I know that 
we could be in, in peace and be in heaven with the Lord when the Antichrist does his dirty work here for these seven years. Okay, just to re reemphasize uh, uh, that. So, so Paul says the tribulation cannot occur till the church has been raptured. One wonders how anyone can read this chapter and still be confused concerning the translation of the church before the tribulation. It's a serious thing to attempt to place the church in the tribulation period. If we teach the tribulation must precede Jesus' coming, then we're guilty of the terrible sin, condemned so emphatically by the Lord Jesus Christ of delaying the coming of the Lord. In Matthew 24, Jesus is speaking of his coming again, says this, Matthew 24, 45 through 51. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he look not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. That's a powerful passage of scripture. Matthew 24, 45 through 51. Here indeed is, is a very solemn warning in the word of God against delaying the Lord's coming. To delay the coming of Christ is to place something between now and his return. You see folks, there's nothing there should be nothing between now and the rapture of the church, okay? I'm looking forward to it. I really am. Like I said a little earlier, I'm in a reunion mode in these, in these uh, uh, days. And so uh, the church will not, to say that Jesus will not come for his church until after, the tribulation is definitely delaying in your mind. Oh, you're not going to change God's time schedule to get that uh, across to us. Okay, uh, uh, I don't want to put anything between today and the imminent rapture of the church, thereby becoming guilty in my mind and heart of delaying his coming. So Jesus may come today Certainly he'll come before the tribulation sets in. For he himself said, and go over to Revelation 3, 10 and 11, because thou have kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from, not in, but from. Notice that? Say it again. Kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Okay, so we need to, to get that, okay? Uh, we'll not be in the tribulation. He'll keep us from the, the tribulation. And upon, and he's, let me just reread that after my comment. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown. Revelation 3, 10 and 11. Oh, my friend, my Christian friends, are you ready to meet him today? That's the question. 
to put it off, to place anything before he comes, results in carelessness and indifference and will be judged by, by the Lord. And so the message to the church, to the Christians is, behold, I come quickly. And he could come at, at any, any time. And to you folks that don't know the Lord, it's the right time to get to know him. Because if you accept him as your savior, as forgiveness of your sins, He'll come into your heart and, and be your savior, folks, and you'll, you'll be ready for the rapture of, of the church. So, yes, he could come today. May the Lord help us truly to be wise stewards according to the words of the Lord Jesus himself in Matthew 24, verse 42. And I'm going to... I'll read several verses here. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have, uh, would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. So that's an invitation, folks, from Matthew 24, verses 42 through 46. May God help us to believe his word to trust his promise and to be ready for his, his uh, coming. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for what's in store for the body of Christ, for the bride of Christ, for the church. Not a church, but the the church, the body of believers. Heavenly Father, just have your way. As we just share a few more thoughts, Lord, prepare hearts. Lord, for the conclusion, prepare hearts to get right with you. And I offer this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I have a few thoughts I want to share with you. One is titled, He is Coming. He is coming, he has said it, coming soon to claim his own. And the time is fast approaching when we'll gather round his throne. We shall then sing forth our praises to the Lamb once crucified, gladly bow the knee before him who in our place once died. No more sorrow, no more trial, every tear be wiped away when our Lord at last shall lead us to the land of endless day. Meanwhile, just a little longer, must we work and watch and pray, then we'll hear the shout of triumph ushering in that golden day. Author is unknown on that, but it's so appropriate for what we have uh, shared uh, today. Well, free to us, but at great cost to God. The late Dr. G. Campbell Morgan told of an experience he had when he was holding a series of meetings in Yorkshire. Yorkshire, Following an evening service, a collier came to him and said, Dr. Morgan, I should like very much to be a Christian, but I can't believe what you said tonight about salvation becoming ours by faith. It isn't possible that God would forgive my sins simply if I trust in Christ. It is far too cheap. Have you been at work today? Dr. Morgan asked the miner. Yes, the miner replied. I work in the pits nearby. How did you get there? The preacher asked. I walked, of course. But how did you get out of the pit? Dr. Morgan inquired. The way I always do, said the miner. 
I stepped into the cage and was lifted up to the surface. And how much did you pay to be brought from the pit? Morgan asked. Nothing, of course, the miner explained. But were you not afraid to trust yourself to the cage in, in that case? Was Dr. Morgan's next question. It was free. Was not that too cheap? It was cheap for me, all right, the collier replied promptly, but it cost the company plenty. Hardly had the words escaped him when the miner realized what he had said. Oh, sir, he cried, I see it all. Forgiveness of sin, salvation, they're free for me, but they cost God so much. That's the invitation, uh, folks. And I, I'd like to share one more thought with you here. And in Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Well, the sails of a ship cost but little compared to the rest of the ship, but they are of great importance to a sailing vessel. A ship may be steered toward a certain destination, but it is not likely to reach it unless the sails are spread. So thanksgiving add wings to our prayers and impels them on to the throne of God. A devout spirit is a thankful spirit. Notice how full the Psalms are of expressions of praise to God. In the worst calamities, there is something for which to be thankful. The father of John and Charles Wesley, seeing the parsonage and all their earthly substance burning up, was full of thankfulness that his wife and children were saved. Let us cultivate a thankful spirit. Psalm 42, 8. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me and my prayer unto the God of my life. Psalm 42, 8. So let's, let's kind of get folks where the rubber hits the road here as, as I bring to close. And this is, it may not be easy, but it's not easy to apologize, to endure success, to begin over, to profit by mistakes, to be unselfish. It's not easy, but to forgive and forget, to take advice, to think and then act, to admit error, to keep out of the rut, to face sneers, to make the best of little. It may not be easy, but to be charitable, to subdue an unruly temper, to avoid mistakes, to maintain a high standard, to keep on trying, to shoulder a deserved blame, to be considerate, to recognize a silver wing, no, it may not be easy, but it always pays. And there's something in the I said here that you need to address, address it with God. We talked about his coming. Be ready for his, for his coming. Just look to the Lord. Now I'd like to give the invitation prayer, okay? Oh, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for providing salvation free. Yes, you paid the price. It was costly. You died for everyone because it says in John 3, 16, whosoever. Well, when you accept Christ, my friend, you're a whosoever. I'm a whosoever, Doug's a whosoever, others are whosoever. So open your heart to Jesus. A simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I know you died on the cross for my sin. Forgive me of my sin and come into my heart. Be my Savior. He will, my friend. And if you've kind of drifted away, Christian friend, 
you can drift back and just say, Lord, I'm coming home. And so that's, that's a simple prayer. You'll be glad you did. God will richly bless you. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you for those folks that made that decision today. Thank you for those that have come back from drifting away. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your imminent return. We are, we're in, oh, Father, the reunion mode. Thank you. God bless each and every one. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, my friends, it's been great to be with you uh, today. God bless you. Please take con real consideration of, of what I shared that Jesus will for your life. And so, love to hear from you. If you'd like to jot a note or if the Lord lays on your heart to make a, a financial gift to our ministry, we'd appreciate it. It's just Valley View Baptist Church, Post Office Box 12653, Ogden, Utah, 84412. Hey, till next time, God, God be with you. And remember, God loves you. Bye for now.